All right, well, I'd first like to congratulate whoever designed this. You may not have seen it in the way in, but I think it's a... See that? It's from Monet to Merkel in Technicolor. <coughs> I'm afraid my presentation isn't. It's uh, rather black and white. Anyway, from Monet to Merkel. Jean Monet is an icon of the construction of post-war Europe. Yet his principle of qualified majority voting, whereby a majority of states could impose decisions on others, which he proposed to and was rejected by the then Labour Prime Minister Clement Attlee in the 1950s, divided Europe for a near quarter century. Since the UK and the EFTA countries, the European Free Trade Area countries, uh, basically Scandinavia and uh, Portugal were dictatorship at the time, declined to accept it. While a majority of the electorate in Britain, which led most of the EFTA countries into the then European community in 1974, on such a qualified majority voting basis, <coughs> voted for Brexit. Also, while generalizations about nationalisms and populisms abound, since the rise of the National Front in France, Cinque Stelle and the Lega Nord in Italy, and the Brexit vote in the UK, something more basic is being displaced. That the European Union since the financial crisis has been serving the interests of banks and markets rather than people. And while demanding, for example, that Greece should disregard the outcome of both a general election and referendum in 2015 against <coughs> austerity, has been demanding that there is no alternative to the austerity claimed by a group of Eurozone finance ministers whose institution, the Eurogroup, has no basis in any treaty and who report to no elected authority. Put simply, post-war Europe is not assuring the democracy for which it initially aimed to reinforce and is not fulfilling the aspirations for high levels of employment, economic <coughs> and social well-being that it had initially aimed to secure and still are the commitments of the third article of its mythically entitled Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union which in practice has proved near to entirely dysfunctional in neglecting the economic <coughs> and social cohesion to which it in principle was committed by the first revision of its 1957 Rome Treaty in the Single European Act of 1986. The Visegrad Four response, a highly articulate and well-informed concern with this was reflected in a declaration following the Brexit vote in the UK by the Visegrad Four of Poland, the Czech Republic, Slovakia and Hungary on the 28th of June 2016. Notably, its title, main title was Trust and Action. But it not only stressed that this was lacking, but also that, one, that there should be limits to supranationalism, in other words, limits to the Monet design, and that the voice of national parliaments needs to be heard. Two, it was time to avoid polarization of debate on more or less Europe, and to focus on getting a better Europe. Three, that there was a need to, re to gain a recovery of treaty commitments to convergence and cohesion. These were in the 1986 Single European Act, to which I've referred boosting investment, supporting innovation, and achieving sustainable jobs. Four, an imperative not only to define challenges, which the European Council or heads of state and government are doing all the time, but also to relate them to existing policy instruments and their effective implementation. Most of, which, of what was demanded in this Visegrad document is entirely compatible with the Europe to which Jacques Delors aspired and was echoed in the 2014 modest proposal by Yanis Varoufakis, James Galbraith and myself. 
it implicitly challenges the case for the ever closer union of Monet and makes the case for a confederal union of consenting member states rather than a supranational union with only one prevailing ideology, austerity, and one hegemon, Germany. What follows below, and what I'm going to say, relates key calls of Visegrad IV to how they could be achieved within the stress of its fourth point, not only to define challenges, perennial, yet perennially unfulfilled, but also to relate them to existing policy instruments and their effective implementation. One, the first of their four points. Implications. To follow through the recommendation of Giuliano Amato when he was vice president of the Giscard Convention on the Constitution for Europe, to invert Monet's qualified majority voting by an enabling majority vote. Votation par majorité habilitante, as Antonio Guterres said to me at the time when I proposed this, he said, if you don't have it in French, it'll never work. Uh, I should have had it in German, but I didn't. By which those member states wishing to proceed with a policy could gain it, but that this would not oblige other member states to adopt it. Giscard d'Estaing dismissed this proposal out of hand. He didn't even refer it to a whole working group on political institutions for his so-called constitution for Europe. Uh, one, uh, two, to allow that the parliaments of all member states should be able to debate and vote on such an enabling majority voting procedure. In other words, if a new policy was proposed, then national parliaments would be able to debate the policy. And if they voted against, uh, then that member state would not be bound by the policy. In other words, confederalism. Two, avoiding debates on more or less Europe and focusing on a better Europe. Implications. This would imply restoring the central committee commitment of the 1986 Single European Act to both an internal market and economic and social cohesion. I think many of you know that Jacques Delors, uh, in fact 1987, invited me to help draft policies for economic and social cohesion. The, uh, the deuxième pilier, as the French would call it, the second pillar of the single European Act, on the basis that no one in the Commission, in the bureaucracy of the Commission, was capable of formulating policies for economic and social cohesion. The, also recognizing that the Stability and Growth Pact implies both stability and growth, which should be sustainable growth, and that this has been traduced, denied, by insistence only on stability, on the dealings of the Troika, IMF, uh, European Central Bank Commission, with member states in financial difficulties since salvaging banks. Recognizing also that the Troikas, like the Eurogroup of Eurozone finance ministers, have no legal basis in any treaty provisions, and that any recognition of them in a revised treaty on the functioning of the European Union should include their obligation to respect stability sustainable growth and economic and social cohesion, as well as the commitment of Article 3 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union to balanced growth and aiming at high levels of employment. In other words, what the Eurogroup has been doing is in denial of the third article of the Treaty concerning the functioning or malfunctioning of the European Union. Restoring and enhancing the community method, which was a commitment of Jean-Claude Juncker in his adoption address to the European Parliament in June 2014, and whose enhancement employs the propo pro implies that proposals from the European Commission should be submitted to all member states by debate for their governments and parliaments, rather than only to the European Parliament. Again, this is an established principle 
which is persistently breached. It's not a new proposal from me, the community method. Enhancing the power of the European Parliament by providing that it should be able to initiate proposals for policies and propose them simultaneously to the European Council and the Commission. The European Parliament is not a parliament. It's a sounding board for opinion that can be generally disregarded. Any serious parliament has the right to propose legislation, not simply to comment on it. Third main point of the Visegrad Four, to focus on a practical restart of convergence, boosting investment, supporting innovation, strengthening a resilient labour market, bringing sustainable jobs. First subsidiary point to their point three, it's been overlooked but should be highlight that European investment bank investments do not count on national debt and that the Amsterdam Special Action Programme of 1997 remitted it to invest in health, education, urban regeneration, green technology and safeguarding the environment, as well as support for small and medium enterprise. It's also been overlooked that with this specific cohesion and convergence remit, which the European Investment Bank accepted in 1997, <coughs> that it should be a powerful agency for cohesion and convergence. The bank quadrupled investment finance from some 20 billion euros, nearly 80 billion, by the time of the onset of the 2007-8 financial crisis, and could do so again from its current base of some 60 billion with, let us say, it's down to 60 billion from 80 since the financial crisis, with co-finance from the European Investment Fund that I recommended to the law and which exists in gleaming glass and aluminium in Luxembourg, recycling global surpluses and thereby realize a 240 billion euro recovery program. Ferry, do you think somebody could kind of get me some water. Yes, I mean, it's, oh, thanks. Now, why 240 billion? Since the multiplier from European Investment Bank investments is up to three, that doesn't sound high, but it means 300%. This could fund a new deal for Europe without national guarantees or fiscal transfers or revisions of the statutes of the bank or the fund, or treaty revisions, as was the case for EU bonds recommended by Delors in his 1993 white paper on growth, competitiveness and employment. It should be recognised also that the IMF itself, or the research division of the IMF, has demonstrated that claims for so-called structural reforms, reducing social protection of labor to increase efficiency, has no basis in reality in any OECD country. And that the Lisbon 2000 European Council recommended innovation agreements by cooperation between management and labor to achieve process innovation and methods of work operation by flexible production rather than flexible labor markets, where flexible labor markets are a euphemism for reducing the rights of organized or other labor, and also to assist the elderly in an aging population. As well as it should be recovered that while the primary responsibility of the European Central Bank is to preserve the internal and external stability of the currency, it also is obliged to support, quote, the general economic policies of the Union, which can be defined by the European Council. Now, I know some of this is really quite technical, but what does that actually mean? It means that Europe already has a government. It means the European Central Bank is not wholly independent, as it persistently pretends. 
because for the governing, for the European Council, heads of state and heads of government, to be able to define a general economic policy which the European Central Bank should support is more than the power that most national governments have. Most central banks are genuinely independent. Their governments cannot tell them what to do. But in the European case, we don't need further treaty revisions. What we need is the European Council to act. Four, defining challenges and linking them with existing instruments and their effective application. One of the most effective links with existing instruments and their application is to recognize that, the e, that EIB, European Investment Bank Group borrowing, does not count on national debt, since this gives the EU now the equivalent of US Treasury bonds by which Roosevelt recovered the US from the Depression. This needs political profile, not least since at a meeting of the European Policy Centre in, in Brussels in March 2014, neither the economic advisor to Donald Tusk, nor to Jörg Katainen, who's supposed to be the economics commissioner, nor to Marianne Thiessen, employment, nor the senior economic advisor to the commission, nor the number two representative of the IMF knew this that European investment bank borrowing does not count on national debt, even though it was confirmed at the same meeting by the former president of the EIB, Philippe Maystadt. <clears throat> also, the proposal by Juncker for a new fund for strategic investments rather than the European Investment Fund, which was set up in 1994, came from a reading of its website rather than of its statutes, which already allow it. That is very welcome. Thank you. I have referred to this before in the context of part, the major part of the crisis in Europe is a combination of arrogance, ignorance, and incompetence. Is it really? acceptable that heads of state and government, that senior European commissioners should not even know what their own Europe's, our bank, European Investment Bank, can do, and that it does not count on national debt. Which, with the downgrading <laughs> This was in, in June 2014. Juncker made the restoring the community method one of his top ten priorities to the European Parliament. And the top one was a European recovery program of 300 billion euros funded by the European Investment Bank. And by November, this had been reduced from 300 to five. Five i.e. virtually nil on the prejudice of Wolfgang Schaubler against bond borrowing and too reminiscent of the association in German of debt with guilt in the same word should on which I've spoken before. Nonetheless the outcome of the recent negotiations for a grand coalition in Germany has been remarkable. For the SPD, the Social Democrats, to get foreign affairs or labor would not be surprising. But to gain the finance ministry is more than many could have hoped. And the appointment of Olaf Scholz, mayor of Hamburg, might, in principle, mean a new direction for Germany in Europe on the lines of the 2016 Visegrad declaration. Now, Scholz has spoken in favour of balanced budget and sound finance, to which he anyway is bound by the pre-Keynesian and economically illiterate commitment to this in a recent retrogressive revision of the German constitution. 
But he's also stated to Der Spiegel that we don't want to dictate to other European countries how they should develop. And the mistakes were surely made in the past, which is a remarkable difference from the presumption of both Merkel and Schäuble that Germany had the right to tell other member states how they should run their economies. He also told Die Welt that Germany urgently needs to respond to, repo to proposals for reshaping Europe by French President Emmanuel Macron. One of the underreported proposals by Macron is for the EU bonds, first put forward in 1993 by Delors, and the since have become known as Eurobonds. Now, the prospect of their adoption may seem scant, unlikely, granted that Angela Merkel pronounced in 2012 that these would only be issued over her dead body. But a key question is whether Merkel understands the nature of bonds any more than did Helmut Kohl, who in 1996 was opposed to the European Investment Bank extending its bond issues to finance investment in the cohesion and convergence areas to which I've already referred of health, education, urban renewal, environmental protection, and venture capital for small and medium enterprise. When this was proposed in 1996, by the then Portuguese Prime Minister Antonio Guterres, Cole stated that he could not agree since, quote unquote, the German taxpayer has paid enough. Yet then he was briefed by the then international advisor to Guterres and myself that EIB bonds are not financed from taxation any more than those of the German Reconstruction Credit Institute, the KFW, Kreditanstalt für Wiederaufbau, he changed his mind. And at the next European <coughs> Council meeting in Amsterdam in the spring of 1997, supported this extension. By all means. Um, I, I, I heard this um, from you several times this part, and I was never able to understand the, the deep causes of the refusal from Merkel and, and from Germany's side. Um, the Europeans. Why is it, why does she say that um, yes, the, her dead body or over her dead body? Why is it so? For, Why is this refusal so strong? I think for, for more than one reason, but the key is, I think, that like Cohn, she doesn't, uh, hasn't, at this point, understood what a bond is. is she thinks that it's paid for by German taxpayers. Yeah. And when Yanis Varoufakis was confronting Schäuble uh, in the Eurogroup, and Yanis made the point, aren't you aware that EIB borrowing doesn't count on national debt and isn't, uh, isn't guaranteed uh, by Germany or other, any other member state, he said, I don't believe it and I don't want it. I mean, this is the staggering level of ignorance, the staggering degree of ignorance at the highest level in this so-called European Sorry. Union. I know it should be unglaublich, unglaublich, uh, but unfortunately it's not. So, uh, developing this point, there also is something in the same briefing to Cole, to which I've referred before and I actually drafted, but not in German, my German isn't that good, of which he'd been unaware and that Merkel may not yet appreciate. European investment bank bonds do not count on the debt of Germany or any other member state of the Union, nor need count on the debt of others, and in this regard they parallel US Treasury bonds which do not count on the debt of California or Delaware or any American state. Moreover, the servicing of EIB bonds is by the member states which gain from the investments that they fund or finance, not by fiscal transfers from others, or nor from the Commission's 
tax-funded own resources. Further, aided by the Amsterdam criteria of social and environmental investments, uh, a point I've mentioned before, the EIB quadrupled its investment finance in the decade from 1997 until the financial crisis to four-fifths of own resources. Now, what do these figures mean? Yeah? 80, in fact, it was 82 billions in 2008 had been the quadrupled outcome of EIB funding of investments in health, <coughs> education, etc., etc., not counting on national debt. That was by then four fifths, 80 percent, of the equivalent of the tax funded and levy funded own resources of the European Commission and approaching macroeconomic significance because of the multipliers. Multiplier by three, European Investment Bank multipliers the, the effect of their investments, for example, in a hospital or a highway or a high-speed rail link. The hospitals, the roads, the high-speed rail links are not built by public enterprise, they're built by private enterprise. So this multiplies income and employment in the private sector. Is there a caveat? Yes, because by convention, rather than a treaty commitment, the EIB only finances half of any investment project. Meant that, at that historically, it started its investments in 1958, a year after the Rome Treaty, made sense. It wanted partners who also were committed uh, to the project and their implementation. And member states mainly made up the rest. On which, however, even before the 2008-78 financial crisis, they were constrained, limited, by the 1992 Maastricht debt and deficit conditions. And this is why, in 1993, Maastricht was 92, I suggested a European investment fund, the EIF to the law, to match EIB funding by complementary bonds, with also the macroeconomic aim of recycling global surpluses in pension funds and sovereign wealth funds, which thereafter flooded into US Treasury bonds for lack of alternative outlets. Uh, without the eco-social investments of joint EIB-EIF bond funding, rather than fostering speculation in subprime and other toxic financial derivatives, of which Yanis Varoufakis has written very well in his book some years ago called The Global Minotaur. Now, if Scholz, Olaf Scholz, now finance minister, were to support the case for joint EIB bond funding of investments, he would not actually be alone in the SPD. Key figures already briefed on it include Per Steinbrück, Frank-Walter Steinmeier, Sigmar Gabriel, who, after briefing by myself, in April 2012 made a joint statement on why we need a social market, in which they said that more national debt and credits were the wrong road, but that an investment-led recovery could be achieved through the European Investment Bank and by better use of the Commission's structural funds. The same goes for Martin Schulz, who at a meeting of myself and the MEP Zelena Ferreira, uh, a socialist, and Jacek Saryuszewski, a member of the People's Party, a conservative, Schulz declared, go with this and make sure you do it in my name, prompting Spiegel thereafter to deem him a committed Eurobonder. And in fact, they deemed him the last Eurobonder in Germany. Moreover, the joint EIB EIF case, let me just come back to why the two. One, because the EIB conventionally has only funded half an investment, and it's reluctant to fund 100%. It's it's the holders of its bonds are mainly uh, at least 30% are pension funds. The others are national governments. National governments are constrained by the debt and deficit conditions of Maastricht, but pension funds also want to be secure 
about an investment and they were and not funding 100% of it the the second reason which i've touched on in what i said already is the european investment bank has a project psychology it likes project it likes uh, physical feasible things and like the world bank it likes big projects yeah so it likes a long motorway a long high speed rail link uh, it's it it cannot psychologically easily think of its bonds having a role in recycling global surpluses so the projects it funds in conventional economic terms would be called micro even though they're or micro even though they're quite big the design i had for the complementary european investment fund was macro to recycle global surpluses you know and i'm i've been in this game for a long time and i must say i get rather tired when you know people talk and i why i like the visegrad declaration is it's absolutely classic that the Commission talks that there should be, or, and even Macron, there should be a European monetary fund. When I designed the European Investment Fund, I was tempted to call it a European monetary fund. But I didn't because we knew very well the deflationary disposition of the international monetary fund, which is why I stress a European investment fund. But anyway, the, uh, the joint EIB-EIF case, including recycling global surpluses, which are immense, they're in trillions, thousands of billions of dollars, and pension funds can't find decent investment outlets. After the financial crisis, one of the world's biggest, the China Investment Corporation, state-owned uh, investment fund, made losses on private sector investments and publicly declared it wanted longer-term public investment projects. You know, so uh, I'm going to restrain myself, but I have been at seminars in Brussels, and a German economist said to me, but what if this fails? And no one said, where's the money coming from? The money is there, and China's investment corporation says it wants public investment projects, which are those of the European Investment Bank, which would be co-financed by the EIF. All right, I'm nearly there. Um, Macron has grasped the case. When Minister of Economy and Industry in the second Valls government in the François Hollande administration, he argued in September 2014 that to offset the low subscribed capital of the European Investment Fund, it is low, it's only four billions, uh, though we should come back to the fact that subscribed capital is not real anyway. When governments subscribe capital, they don't hand over any money. They say, they define that the subscribed capital of an institution shall be X. And then, if there is a need to use the capital, then they put the money forward. I mean, I'm tired also of hearing, uh, not from you, but from much of the press and media, that private sector banks and hedge funds have all the bright guys. And that they have to pay themselves these ridiculous bonuses up front mind you, yes, not after performance, because otherwise the bright guys will go to other banks. The bright, the bright design is in the European public financial institutions, and it's there. And I must say I'm very glad Macron is very bright. We might, you might or might not agree with his labor market reforms, but on this he's dead right. So he argued, uh, remarkably, because he wasn't finance minister, he was minister of economy 
uh, and industry. But François Hollande called for a joint meeting of finance ministers and industry ministers. And Macron, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, uh, argued the case that the low subscribed capital of the European Investment Fund should access unused resources in the European stability mechanism. Now, as an advisor put it at the time to the newspaper Les Echo, if we could mobilize 20 to 40 billion from the European stability mechanism to recapitalize the European Investment Fund, you then have a multiplier effect on the European Investment Bank that can reach almost 200 billion of public money. Now, I know that we're throwing figures around here, but some of these figures are really very simple. You know, it's like two times three equals six, and four times three equals 12. It's not more complicated than that. You don't need sophisticated econometrics. Now, Schabler opposed Macron, claiming that this was not the remit of the European stability mechanism, i.e. for what it had been designed. But there then was legal advice to the European Parliament which declared that it was not excluded that the European stability mechanism should fulfill other tasks to ensure the stability of the euro, for which a sustained recovery of the European economy is vital. I mean, stability in, in, in German, stabilitet, I mean, <laughs> what does it mean? Don't do anything. Inaction. Whereas stability of Europe is in question because of very high levels of unemployment and youth unemployment in, in key economies and countries. So again, the private sector multiplier from EIB investments range up to three, which could mean that the total public and private investment generator could reach some 600 billions. Now again, what, what is 100 billion? The own resources of the European Commission are just over 100 billion, yeah? so about 110 to 115 billion. So you're talking about investment five times the total own resources of the Commission, which covers everything from agri agriculture to research and development and so forth. Further, because the Roosevelt New Deal was bond finance, it managed to reduce unemployment from 22% to 8% in the seven years uh, from 1933 to 1940 with an average annual federal deficit of only 3%, which happens to be the Maastricht limit. Now, Schäuble is no longer German finance minister, whereas Macron is president of France. And if Macron chose to restate the integration case within an ever European integration case within an ever valid, I'm reading this from what was put on Social Europe last week, and I must say the editor has introduced ever valid, <laughs> French German axis that propelled the initiative for European community in the 1950s, which were my words, this could retrieve the European Germany to which Adenauer, Brandt, Schmidt, and Kohl aspired, rather than the German Europe, which emerged with the austerity demands of Schäuble and Merkel after the financial crisis of 2007 8 and which would thereby be very much on the lines of the recommendation of the Visegrad Four in its 2016 declaration, as I've outlined and analyzed above. Bravo. Thank you.